Hello, I'm Christopher Kassan and this is Ireland's Edge. Trans people continue to face discrimination and demonisation, with their real lives and experiences too often ignored by a public debate fuelled by toxic myths and hatred. The writer and journalist Sean Fay's best-selling book, The Transgender Issue, argues that we've been having the wrong conversation by making trans people seen and not heard, and that trans justice is justice for all. At Ireland's Edge in Dingle, Sean joined me to discuss her book and her work, telling me about her childhood visits to Ireland, her dating advice column, and her fascinating queer history podcast series, Call Me Mother. On today's episode, we'll hear a short excerpt from that discussion, where we talk about the experiences of trans people and the need for social solidarity against hate and intolerance. I asked Sean to tell us about her work revealing the shocking scale of social problems like unemployment, homelessness and self-harm that far too many trans people still have to deal with. So the mental health outcomes of trans people are so bad is because of the society in which we live. But with one in four trans people being homeless, it's extraordinarily high. It's such a a huge over-representation. And homelessness is such a sign of social disenfranchisement. You know that all outcomes, if you don't have a home, um, are likely to be worse. Your mental health, your physical health, your employment... um, your empo- yeah, your likelihood of employment, your finances. And of course, like, um, if you drill down into those statistics, say, about trans homelessness, um, it starts so young, is that in the UK, um, about a qu- over a quarter of all homeless people under the age of 25 are LGBT, and seven, over 70% of those people say that their LGBT identity is directly related to why they're homeless. Yeah. And then trans people are so overrepresented in that, considering we're the smallest subset in LGBT. And so what, you, what starts to you build there, a picture, is that this starts really young. There's community rejection, family rejection, homelessness, and once you're homeless at 15, 16, unfortunately, that sort of problem entrenches itself in a person's life. And mm-hmm. so what I wanted to do with the book is to kind of um, focus in on that and really paint a picture. Because I do think, fundamentally, people, most people are empathetic um, and actually can relate. I think one of the, thing, the things that's often done with regards to trans people is to other them. You asked me about like, the history of... sort of talked about the history of representation is to be like focusing on the surgery, focusing on things that make us sort of... Like, Um, really ostentatiously seem really different to the rest of the population. Actual things like being rejected by your family, being bullied at school, struggling to get a house, struggling to make enough money to live. These things, I think, are actually things that we can all relate to and actually probably are the prime concerns of most trans people. Is there something, is there maybe a, like, you know, you talk in the book about how, like, trans liberation is is good for everybody. It's not just, like, Mm. a niche thing. Like, obviously, the, the, the challenges that trans people face, homelessness you mentioned, Trans people are more likely to be unemployed, and other, you know, there are a lot of other socioeconomic problems there. Are the same problems faced by many other marginalised groups? And is there something that, like, empathy can perhaps be a route towards solidarity, where we see, like, that, you know, a lot of people are struggling against common problems. How do you, how do you make people kind of bridge that gap towards solidarity from sympathy or empathy? <laughs> Yeah, it's a difficult one because I think sometimes uh, people become quite like I think I think it's really great that the way the Internet has kind of allowed us to learn more about perhaps different political experiences to our own personal experiences to our own around gender, around race, around less so often as ostensibly about class, but like, uh, you know, around these kind of big issues of identity. But I think sometimes the way that's presented and packaged can actually, and particularly like be sold within the corporate sphere, is like you need this diversity and inclusion training and we're here to sell it to you. That's a big business model. Is it makes people quite nervous. And I think with the trans context is that people can become quite afraid that trans is this high, to engage with a trans person, you need this highly specialist set of knowledge about pronouns. And, um, and, and, uh, and if you don't have it, um, you, you're going to get cancelled. Um, <laughs> and, and so that can really stifle discussion. And I think what I wanted to sort of take people back to with, with this book as a tool was the idea that you don't really need that. You don't need to like, understand everything about my internal psychological experience because you never will understand it, just as I will never understand uh, the way uh, moving through the world with racist oppression. It's just not something I'm going to be able to experience in the way that a black 
or, or understanding the way that a black person will have experienced it. However, there are probably certain things that I can understand what it's like to, um, to not be the normative experience in a society, to look around in a room and know that I'm in the minority in the room. So there are certain ways in which I can perhaps um, create a link between my experience and the experience of a person of colour. Um, and what I wanted to do was create a tool that allows people to make those connections for themselves rather than um, put people, I worry that we're all put sometimes in too much of an infantilized position where it's like you, ha you there's almost like a test to pass about how inclusive you are and, and there's a possibility of failure. And I think for me, empathy is, is something that you create not by telling people that this is how you be empathetic. I think it's something that we're actually geared towards being as just human beings. Um, but what you just sometimes need to do is humanize a topic for people. And, and present it. And with trans people, I think that one of the ways that empathy, our capacity for empathy or society's capacity for empathy has been severed is that like, there's just no discussion, at least in the UK context of like, yeah, of, like really anything that about the, the top five things, if I went to any trans social group or like even my own friends, that they're, like, are their concerns about being trans are not the things that are filling the pages of like yeah. the Guardian columns or the Sunday Times. Well, yeah. I want to ask you about that because, I mean, we had gender self-identification in Ireland for a number of years now mm. for like a long time. There wasn't a lot of public controversy compared perhaps to the way that it has been debated and issues like that. Well, I struggle to, I don't even want to use the word issues because, you know, calling somebody the way that they would like to be referred to. It doesn't really seem like to me an issue. It just seems like a, an issue of common decency and respect. But in the UK, it does seem to have become a kind of toxic, horrifying... I mean, a lot of the time we look now from Ireland towards public debate in the UK with a kind of... as if you're watching some kind of horrifying car crash that you can't look away from. <laughs> yes. Put on Sky News to see who's Prime Minister today or whatever. Yeah. But the, certainly the debate over the transgender issue, in big quotation marks, seems to be something that has just reached a level of toxicity um, that from the outside, that's not to say that there are not issues of transphobia and you know, things like that in Ireland, which they absolutely are, and we'll get on to talk about that, but in the UK there does seem to be something very specific going on in the years after Brexit as well. Like, do you, do you have any kind of idea why <laughs> in Britain at this particular moment in history that has happened, that it has become such a fraught issue in a way that it, like, is not spoken about in the same ways in many other countries, even neighbouring countries. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's a confluence of certain historical things that are happening in the UK generally, politically at the moment, and trans people have, have, have materialised as one of the kind of lightning rods in this so-called culture war. And I think... Um, yeah, I think there is a specifically British flavour to, to the intensity of the transphobia there. And I think, you know, it's, Britain is a deeply corrupt nation that's never really reconciled with its imperialist history. It's obviously falling apart the seams and unwilling to admit that it is. And we're descending into a paranoid insularity, whether it's through Brexit, whether it's through like our disgusting policy towards, um, you know, migrants um, in boats um, and towards trans people and a whole host of other groups. And there is a certain paranoia, and I think it's not um, surprising to me that uh, a, tra a certain kind of transphobic discourse is taken hold in the same time as, like, for example, this insularity, say, around something like Brexit, which is all about, like, actually transphobia and uh, this kind of nationalist discourse can often like, have quite a lot in common. They're about the idea of in-groups and out-groups, defining the borders, who gets to be in, who gets to be out, a paranoia about infiltration, um, there's actually quite a lot of overlap there um, with how um, trans people, particularly in some, certain like British feminist discourses, trans women are viewed as like sort of alien invaders to womanhood itself with the idea of like, I don't know, the decrepit nation state being like invaded um, or compromised in some way or losing sovereignty. And of course, like what trans people with gender recognition laws are looking for really is a relaxation of the state's ability to the British state, in, in my case, to control the lines of gender itself by saying, like, look, it's not really appropriate that you pathologize and make people have a mental health diagnosis in order to change documents that allow them to move through society freely. And we've just completely, yeah, I mean, lost it <laughs> in response to the idea that that, 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 that 
could be a, a human right. So I think, I think there is a lot there about the general, transphobia being a manifestation of a general paranoid and slightly pessimistic culture that has taken root in the UK because of a whole host of other factors. Um, like, I think I, I sort of point to in the book, and I'm very keen to say when people, I'm sure a lot of people here, when you're talking about the UK discourse, there's a specific way it merges with a kind of feminist discourse in the UK too, is that I think if I was being generous, some of the um, ways in which feminist discourse, clearly transphobia has taken root there, is an anxiety um, about sh ever shrinking space for, for women, particularly for vulnerable women, whether that's like women's specialist services, crisis services, also, like, and that's all to do with our austerity policies since pretty much 2010 so like you know over a decade is that again like analysis shows again and again like women were hit hardest by our austerity policies um single mothers um women in in abusive situations taking away the sort of you know financial independence or access to financial independence um and and a, a complete lack of services to pick up for that i think there are some women who quite rightly recognize there is a sense of shrinking space for women just as like violence against women is undiminished. Unfortunately, what I think a lot of our press and um, the right wing in the UK is very invested in doing is scape scapegoating. Yeah. And it's much easier in some ways to keep churning out narratives that it's the handful of trans women in the UK who experience similar rates of domestic violence. Um, who are perhaps taking away space. I was going to ask, do you think that, I mean, is that a diversionary tactic that is used by right-wing media and right-wing politicians? I mean, I was struck during the summer, during the Tory leadership contest, there was a period there where uh, I believe it was Penny Mordaunt who had like made some vaguely positive noises about gender self idea when she was a minister, then got into some kind of arms race with the other candidates as to who could be more transphobic, yeah. making <laughs> cringe-inducing speeches about who didn't, did not have particular parts of anatomy and so on in kind of appalling ways that it just seemed like, is that just, you know, a, a system that is undiminished in its patriarchy and misogyny, diverting discussion from, well, why have you cut funding for this? Why have you cut funding for that? Why are women still having to put up with this? Why the police not deal with this, etc.? by scapegoating a smaller group that is also vulnerable? Like, is that it? Do you think that that's a deliberate diversionary tactic that is used? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think the Murdoch press, you know, the Times of London um, kind of just like took very specifically did an editorial. In fact, they were actually pretty neutral. And in, in fact, there were some pro trans pieces in sort of 2016, early 2017, um, scheduled in the Times. So I like have insider knowledge on that. However, what happens in, the t in, in 2017 is that suddenly it's almost like there is an editorial line taken against trans people, basically, where um, w when Theresa May announced that she was going to look at reforming our gender recognition laws. And I think, um, yeah, of course, Rupert Murdoch, I know, doesn't sit, everyone's so, like, people who work at the Times are always keen to tell me this. Like, I know he doesn't sit there and dictate what the papers he owns runs, but I think at the same time, they all have a, cons media in the UK has a very conservative, uh, I don't know, inclination, generally, um, if you compare it to other European countries. And in general, we've been going hurtling from crisis to crisis in the UK, Brexit, the way that COVID was handled, you know, they were having parties left, right and centre while like we were in lockdown and right through to the fact that, yeah, like it's a different prime minister every week at the moment. And I think like all of that is, is that there's desperate need for diversionary tactics. In the months since I spoke with Sean, Ireland has unfortunately seen more of the kind of myths and diversion that the press and social media have targeted against trans people in the UK. It is more vital than ever for us to listen to trans voices and to remember to show solidarity against all forms of hatred, discrimination and inequality. As Sean reminds us, trans liberation means liberation for all. Thank you so much to her for joining us in Dingle. On our next episode, we'll discuss Ireland's booming corporation tax receipts and ask what happens after the gold rush. To make sure you don't miss that or any of our future episodes, subscribe now wherever you get your podcasts. This has been a South Wind Blows production, and I'm Christopher Kassan. Thank you for joining us. I look forward to your company next time on Ireland's Edge.